just a big praise in the house. Amen. You can be seated. Hallelujah. And God is good. God is so good to us. Man, let's, uh, let's give Jesus thanks for all this worship team today. Man, that was awesome. Thank you, sir. Hallelujah. Hey, uh, Martin, could I make sure we have a mic that's available uh, in case I want to have Lisa come and pray or cast out devils or something? <laughs> Amen. Praise God. How many of you feel more like you do now than you did when you got here? Amen. Good to know. Yeah. You know, grace sets us free. Sets us free from living by rules and living by a sense of have to. It sets us free from having a, like a, a heart filled with dread. You know, there's a lot of preachers who don't really believe that what happened at the cross was enough. So that's why they have to add rules and that's why they, they have to put pressure on people to give or put pressure on people to, to do whatever. I, I, like, uh, I like what the Lord told a friend of mine. Uh, he had worked for a church for years and... Um, was under some pretty heavy dominating type of leadership. And uh, man, the Lord really started to open his eyes to what grace has provided. And he'd come to like 30 years working at this church and he's just honestly asked God, what am I supposed to do? And God, he always speaks in such simple but powerful terms. God just told him, go live life. Just go live life. And I think that's what grace opens the door for us is that we have the opportunity to just go live life in the joy of the Lord. Hallelujah. Because that, that's, that's our principal aim in life is to enjoy God. To enjoy everything that, that the cross provided for us. And I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful we don't have to jump through religious hoops. We don't have to worry about whether or not we're right with God, whether we're going to make heaven our home, whether we're going to be ready for the rapture. Jesus took care of that at the cross. All I have to do is say, yes, I accept. That's really, that's really the bottom line, isn't it? You want to know a couple of my pet peeves? Sure you do. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to get to 1 John chapter 4. But one of the pet peeves I have is when, when ministers... Uh, kind of make us feel that we should be doing what they're doing because of the call of God that's on their life. You know what I'm saying? You ever, you, have you ever had an evangelist maybe in the past come to the church you were attending and it's just kind of like he goes out and met, uh, witnesses on the street so you should go out and witness on the street and if you're not doing that and if you're not winning so many souls uh, then you're probably not even born again. You ever been in the, you've ever, ever been in that service? I have several times. It's just not true. Or sometimes, and I think pastors and preachers are well-meaning. I'm not down on pastors and preachers. But sometimes they're trying to make us be copies of them rather than Jesus' image being born on the inside of us. So in, in other words, like it's because of my calling and the grace of God that's on me, I can sit and study for hours and enjoy it. Okay, some of you probably can't sit and read for 10 or 15 minutes without getting antsy, okay? But it would, be, it would be wrong for me to say, well, because I study the word so much time every day that you ought to do the same thing. Because then I'm trying to recreate you in my image, not hook you directly to Jesus so he, you bear his image. You, you feel what I'm saying? Okay, now here's another pet peeve that's on the other side of the aisle. Okay, this is maybe from the pew to the pulpit rather than from the pulpit to the pew. But I think there's some congregations that want to put everything that's in the work of the ministry on the people who are paid staff or the highest volunteer leaders. In other words, well, let me just give you an example. We worked at a church in Fort Worth for about 25 years. And so this story could probably be repeated. But we were encouraging people to... Uh, 
you know, to be a part of the greeter team. And uh, Miss Lisa is like the greeter par excellence. She just, if she doesn't know your name yet, she will. You're just marked. Okay, you're, 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 you're going to be known. And you're going to be connected to other people who will know your name, given enough time. So there was this lady that uh, Lisa approached and said, hey, I would love for you to be a part of the greeter team. And her response, literally her response was, that's your job. And I don't know what she thought, but Lisa has never been on, on the staff of any church that I've been a part of. She's never, she's never drawn a paycheck. I kind of liked it that way because my family's not church property. Thank you for that two amens. <clears throat> See, a lot of times churches feel like, well, if you get the pastor, you get everything he has and every, we're gonna just drain them dry. See, that's just as wrong. It's, it's, not, it's, not the, it's not the pastoral staff's job to invite people. They don't do all the praying. They don't, you know what? If we share the load. Amen. I like this. I'm calling, I'm calling today's message overcomer because you bear the image of Christ. You bear the victorious image of Jesus. He always causes us to triumph in Christ. You're an overcomer. And the day you feel the less like an overcomer, that's when you need to believe it the most. Did I say that right? The less you feel that way is when you need to believe it the most or you're subject to listen to the enemy's lies and that's never gonna take you any place good. First John four, chapter four, uh, the uh, ESV translation, John says, little children, you are from God. Can I just can look this way, make eye contact? Can I just say that you might not feel that way, but you are from God. You're on a mission from God. You have an assignment from God. Every day, the psalmist said in Psalm chapter 139 that every day of your life was written in his book. So there's a divine purpose for every day of your life. And the biggest part of that is just enjoy life, enjoy God, enjoy living, follow the prompting of your heart and the Holy Spirit. You are from God and have overcome them for he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. I like the fact that he put that this way because he that is in you is Jesus Christ. He that is in you is the Holy Spirit who is God. He that is in you, who Paul said you're one spirit with, knows everything, holds all power, is the almighty God. Now, I'm, I'm probably like you in this. I don't always know what to do with that, but I just accept it as truth. And when I act like it the least is when I need to believe it the most. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. So he becomes our identity. If I look at myself and if I look at my failure and if I look at my track record, I'm gonna see less than an overcomer. But we learned a few uh, sessions ago that I am not looking at any person, including myself after the flesh anymore. I'm looking at myself after the spirit and after who God says that I am. That means I'm an overcomer. That means I'm victorious. That means I'm prosperous. That means I'm forgiven. That means I'm triumphant. So all of this stuff that's true in my spirit, man, has to find a working out into my mind and into my flesh. I like what Dallas Willard says about discipleship. He said, discipleship is the process of becoming who Jesus would be if he were you. God bless Dallas Willard. Think about that for a second. All of this stuff that's true in my spirit has to work its way into my mind, will, and emotion so that my mind is renewed. I'm beginning to take on that image. As I behold Jesus, I'm transformed little by little into the image of Christ. And so this process of discipleship shouldn't be coming a miniature me or a miniature whoever pastor comes this way. It should be connecting you directly to Jesus so you become not a copy but you become an original of Jesus if he were you. 
I think that's awesome. I think that's great. Now, while your, your mind might right now be saying, well, I don't even think that's in the realm of possibility. We live in the realm of the supernatural. God has always chosen to cooperate God and man. There's a natural side to this life and there's a spiritual supernatural side to this life. And if you think all there is is the natural, you're a materialist, well then you've got, you've got very limited sight because you're limited to what you think is best. But when you get over on the supernatural God, Holy Spirit side, there's a whole nother vista that opens up because what we can see is not all there is. Now, Paul, I love 1 Corinthians chapter 2. It's, it, this is probably, I would say, one of my favorite chapters in the whole Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1. Paul says, And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with only or with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Why, why is that important? Well, first of all, everything, everything hinges on, everything is founded on Jesus. Everything we do as a church, everything we do as a believer should be with Jesus first and foremost. And anything that was taken care of at the cross can't pass through that cross unless I believe some doctrine of devils or I believe somebody's experience over the word. If it was paid for at the cross, it's illegal and unlawful. Doesn't mean the devil won't try it. We live in a fallen world, but the fact of the matter is I can stand against anything that Jesus paid for me to be delivered from at the cross. So I came to you proclaiming to you the testimony of God and I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus and him crucified. And listen to this. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. I can relate to that. You know, in our flesh, there's no good thing, but that doesn't mean there's no good thing in us. But in our flesh, we fear rejection. In our flesh, we can, we can be in fear and trembling because of what are people going to think of me. And it wasn't that Paul was perfect. He was powerful. He was called. He was anointed. And yet, he was very real about the fact that when he was in front of that congregation in, this, in the town of Corinth, he was in fear and trembling. He says, my speech and my message was not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. Paul was always having to uh, defend his ministry because people called him unimpressive. People said, you're, you're not as good a speaker as Apollos, or we're not even sure that you really... He, that you're really an apostle because you didn't see Jesus. You were born in the wrong season, brother. And you know what? He didn't let any of that stop him from doing what God called him to do. And man, when Paul preached, it might not have been the most eloquent, eloquent speech that you've ever heard, but there was demonstration of the spirit and power. In other words, the Holy Spirit showed up and stuff happened. Thank God for churches that have not eliminated the supernatural power of God. Thank God for churches that still believe in the power of prayer. Well, praise God. But I, I do have to wonder this. When you read the New Testament, you read the book of Acts, and you read the epistles, I wonder sometime if, if the Apostle Paul walked into most churches, if he would scratch his head and say, what happened? He goes on to say in chapter two, and I love this, as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through the spirit. 
you know what? There are, there are things that there are things that are true about you. that you'll never know unless the Holy Spirit reveals them to you. I mean, you just think of people, even stories in the Old Testament, how, how the angel said, Gideon, thou mighty man of valor. And his response was not, you know what? Praise God, amen, that's right, that's who I am in the spirit. No, he had questions. He said, how, that's not true is basically what he's saying. And he, he had this question, if that's true, then why are we facing all the problems that we're facing? You know, that might be you today. If that's true, why is my family attacked? Why am I dealing with all these health issues? I think part of it might be that the enemy mounts no attack where he feels no threat. Did I say that right? You look like you're really having the struggle to think about that. If you're no threat to the enemy, why would he pay any attention to you? But if he can get you discouraged or worse yet, blaming something that's happened negative, something negative that's happened, if he can get you blaming God for it, then he's pretty much got you in neutral. He's neutralized you. You're, you will no, not be a threat. God's good. The devil's bad. That's about as complicated as theology should get right there. The rest of it, we've had to have religious rhetoric twist what you can awesome, you can just see as reality and cause so many churches to believe lies that you can't find in here. I wish I could just come down there so I could take your pulse. Just touch you on the shoulder, look you in the eye, make sure you're okay. Man, some of these things, you couldn't even imagine how good they are. But God reveals them to us through the Spirit. Because you know what? You are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. And some of those good works are obviously so big, you and your natural mind would say, no, that, there's no way possible that that could be me. I like to think of it this way. He reveals these things to us through the Holy Spirit and it's the Holy Spirit's power on the inside of us that pulls these things off. In other words, your prayer might be the contact that releases the power of God, but the power is of God, not you. I mean, you stop and think about it. The gifts of the Spirit, a word of wisdom, a word of knowledge, working of miracles, all of those things come through the spirit. They're not, you might be, a, you might be the conduit that, that that miracle flows through, but it doesn't have anything to do with you or your goodness. It's just how good God is. He chooses to work with people. I, I like to call it the outworking of the indwelling. All of this stuff is just a matter of fact that Jesus is in you, he's gonna come out. The Holy Spirit lives in you, he's gonna leak out of you. So Jesus just, Jesus demonstrated the power of the Holy Spirit unquenched in a man for three plus years. Think about everything he did. John chapter, chapter 21 of John, he talks about the stuff that Jesus did. His works were so numerous that if they'd been written in books, he said, I don't even know if the world could contain the record of the works that Jesus did while he was here. I mean, we have, we have the gospel, these four books. I mean, John only records like seven miracles. So the others, just think about it. They're, they're just take up about that much room in your New Testament. But John said, basically, he saw so many miracles and so much miraculous stuff that it must have happened everywhere Jesus went. It must have happened all along the way. The prayers that were answered, the people that were healed, the miracles that took place. And all of that was demonstrated by Jesus who came to walk as a man who was filled with the Holy Spirit as a prototype and as, as, as an example. In other words, his walk was an example of how you and I should walk full of the Spirit, believing God. 
Thank you for those. That's right. We're getting some traction here. We're, we're gaining some ground. Why is that? That's true, and that's who you are in the Spirit. You know, Jesus didn't do anything miraculous until the Holy Spirit came on him. When he went to be baptized, and he was not just baptized with water, but the Holy Spirit descended on him and remained. After that took place, he, he cast out devils, he healed the sick, he raised the dead, he spoke to storms and stopped them, he, he healed the sick, turned water into wine. But it was after the Holy Spirit came on him. Well, the Holy Spirit's on you and he's looking to get out. It's the outworking of the indwelling. Jesus said, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. That helper is the Holy Spirit. I'll give you another helper. Another, the Greek word here is another just like the other one. In other words, I'm going to give you a, a helper, the Holy Spirit, and he's just like me. He's going to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he dwells with you or by your side or in your presence and he will be in you. Well, that was future tense for those people because the cross hadn't happened yet, but we're living after the cross. The Holy Spirit dwells among us and he lives in us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just, just turn to your neighbor and look him up and down for a second. It's amazing that the Holy Spirit lives in that. He said the Holy Spirit will be in you. He said, I will not leave you as orphans. What? Is it up there? Yeah. I will not leave you as orphans. Who does it say I will come to you? He said, I will come to you. He says, I'm going to ask the Father. He's going to send you another comforter, somebody just like me. I'm not going to leave you orphans. I will come to you. So guess who's living on the inside of you? You got the same spirit Jesus had. Man, I'm telling you, you're wall-to-wall -wall Jesus on the inside of you. Hallelujah. And he finishes up by saying, because I live, you, will, you also will live. In that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. I mean, how much more does he have to say this to penetrate our thick skulls? I mean, it's Jesus living on the inside of you. And the more you become mindful of the fact that it's him living on the inside of you, then when you get those strange promptings, to do something supernatural, to pray something, to say something that's outside of your scope of possibility for you and your own flesh to bring it to pass, it won't be such a struggle. And you know what? You will seem a little strange to your neighbors because when you go around speaking to mountains, they don't do that. Or at least they don't do it the way they see you do it. I mean, they cuss their cars, they cuss traffic lights. So maybe they wouldn't think it, but the fact of the matter is you're speaking something that's God's will in the name of Jesus. Hey, his word coming out of your mouth is the same power is released as the word was coming out of his mouth. Man. So what if we worked on just being a little more aware of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit? See, he's our advantage. I mean, it's not even fair. We're hooked up to the one that knows everything. And I'm not just talking about everything related to church. I'm talking about everything that related, relates to life. I mean, he knows everything there is to know about woodworking, about quilting. I'm not a big quilting fan, I admit. I only watch it when it gets to the finals. But the fact of the matter is he knows everything about everything. He knows everything about daycare. He knows everything about nursing. He knows everything about business. He knows and he will make you a genius if you listen to him. At least look like one. But he's our advantage. His, should not his presence in us make a difference? It should. 
and it does. I mean, there was basically war over, over this thought that there is something called the priesthood of every believer. That we didn't need a mediator, a man to be a mediator and to dispense grace and elements of communion, the Eucharist. That, that we didn't need somebody to interpret the word for us that we could read it for ourselves. And that every believer not only is a minister, but has a ministry. I'm talking about you. There's stuff that God put in your heart that only you're going to be able to pull off. And you with Jesus are a majority and you are supernatural. So he wants to use everything. He wants to use everything you know how to do to promote Jesus in your area of influence. I'll just tell you this. This might not, this might not be news to you, but I just want to say it anyway. God is not using any of us because of us. He's using us in spite of us. I get that. I get that. And, you know, you'll have people all the time will say, well, God, God can't use a dirty vessel. Well, unfortunately, that's all he's got to work with. And he will, he will use anybody that's yielded. He's not looking for perfect vessels. He's looking for willing vessels. Thank you for that thunderous amen, Lisa. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Man, you know what? This is something I know I'm speaking to the choir here. You know what I mean by that? We don't have choirs anymore, but you, I know you know this already. But the gifts of the Spirit, those manifestations of the Holy Spirit, are not signs of maturity. They just, it's equipment that comes with the new birth. You've been given gifts, and it doesn't take maturity to operate them. It takes maturity to operate them well. But the fact of the matter, just because somebody speaks in tongues or interprets tongues or has a miraculous things happen around them does not mean that they are mature. So we've got, to, we've got to watch that, don't we? Everything that glitters is not gold. Hallelujah. I'm sorry, I'm tempted to do a lot of pastoring today. See, God's, God's only real limitation is our lack of cooperation. And that's because he's chosen to work with man. Jesus was fully God, fully man. That's a pattern that he, that he takes. When you yield to the Lordship of Jesus and you say yes to him, it should be that pattern taking place that God lives in you, but yet you're still a person. That means it takes our cooperation. We have to say yes. And cooperation is simple, simple obedience. He, if he gives me a prompting, a nudge, an idea, and I simply flow with that nudge, then that's supernatural. That's cooperating with the Holy Spirit. I like, I like what our friend Charlie Kraft used to, used to say. He said, you know what? Just obey God. Do what he says to do. Go where he says to go. Say what he says to say and leave the results up to him. Just simple obedience. If, 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 if God tells you to give me $20, then give me $20. If you want to go above and beyond, make it 100 And Because watch this. And you know I'm speaking. I'm just making fun. Don't give me $100. But the point is this, what if you missed it and that wasn't God? I mean, that's, that is, that's pretty uh, low, what am I, what's the word? It's low risk. And there's so much of stuff that is low risk. If God, if God speaks to you to pray for someone in the body, then go pray for them. Or at the very least, if he doesn't prompt you to go pray for them, then take time right then to pray for them. I mean, it's just like they're, 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 that nudge, the, the more easy you flow with him, 
it's like the nudge and the action just become one, one motion. It's like God's word coming to you through an impression or whatever, however he speaks to you. Okay, I think, I think he probably shows up personally with Miss Lisa because she prays every morning. With, we, we have prayer chairs, so we go pray, we read the Bible. We've been praying for y'all. Apparently, some of y'all really need it, too. <laughs> and judging what, from what I've been looking at the last month, y'all are just such a blessing. We just, we love y'all. Yeah, me too. Matthew chapter 10, verse 8, Jesus tells the disciples, and we're disciples, we're disciplined ones, we're learning this walk, we're apprentices. He says, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely you have received, freely give. Now, I know you don't, you don't need any kind of a language lesson, so I won't, go, I won't go into this. I don't know much of it. But this, the, all of the verbs in here, heal, raise, cleanse, are in the present imperative. In other words, that's like a now command. So Jesus, this is, what the, this is what the Discovery Bible says about this Greek tense. It means do it now. Make this happen. Don't just try. Freely you have received, this word received, listen to this, this is powerful. That which you've actively, not passively, actively accepted, it's the taking of something that's available. I mean, this is, this is, this is powerful stuff. Jesus wasn't making a suggestion. He was issuing a command, heal the sick, raise the dead. So I can't do that. Jesus in you can do that. He's the healer in you. He's the raiser from the dead in you. He is the, he is the leper cleanser in you. He is the caster out of devils in you. Can I, can I make a quick aside here? Can I, take, can I take time? I only have a few minutes left. But two places in the New Testament that I know this word for cast out devils is used. And one of them is where it's talking about casting out devils. It's the Greek word ekabalo, cast out. The other place I know that it's used is when Jesus tells the disciples to pray for laborers that they be sent out into the harvest, it's that same word, cast out. I think most Christians get snuggled into their chairs and this is like we sit in this chair and this is my Christian life is lived out in church. And so we get comfortable with Christianity being something, it's an activity that takes place within an auditorium, and for the most part, we're spectators, not participators. Heal the sick, cast out devils. Now, here's something that, you, you know, people will ask me, you know, well, this happened. I prayed for Aunt Matilda, and she died anyway. Why is that? I don't know. But I do know this, if we could just start to do things the way Jesus and the apostles did, we might come closer to getting better results. What do you mean, Pastor Mark? Well, this is what I mean. If you do a study of the miraculous events in the New Testament, you will find that Jesus nor the apostles prayed for the sick. But what do we do? We take the one verse that I know of from James and apply that to every situation, which the one in James says, let, let the sick call for the elders of the church and let them anoint with oil and pray the prayer of faith, okay? We're told in Bible school, never build a doctrine around one verse, but we've done that. 
And then we wonder, why is it that our ministry is not as effective as we'd like to see? Well, maybe we're not doing the biblical pattern. As a matter of fact, when I was working on my master's, I had an assignment. The, the whole semester's assignment was to look throughout the whole New Testament and record every miraculous event, healing, other miracles, and talk about how they happened, what happened, what was the result, how were they affected. You cannot find them praying for anybody. And Jesus here didn't say he, uh, pray for the sick. He said heal the sick. And he didn't act like it was an option as to whether to do it. And he didn't act like it was something that we would necessarily have to make happen on our own. But he said, go do it. You make this work. Find out how to do it. I'm just saying this. If we could just do it in the Jesus style, how did he do it? My, the results of my study was this. If you're looking for a pattern, the pattern was that there was no pattern. Okay, sometimes Jesus spoke to people. Sometimes there was a command to simply get up and walk. Sometimes he spit in the dirt and make mud, made mud and rub it in people's eyes. You know what that says to me? It means these people are freely living life and they're just going with the flow of the Holy Spirit. I'm not talking about just being weird. If you're going to do something weird like make mud and put it in people's eyes, the truth should be that they walk away seeing. Okay, then we'll know if you're really flowing with God. But the point of the matter is, man, I'm like, man, there's like I've got 34 seconds left. I'm turning off my timer. Are we okay? All right. Where was I before? Oh. So this, 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 was, uh, this was part of a reading assignment. And I love what, I love what this, and this was, I think this was a Baptist school. I know some of you are Baptists. Thank God for the Baptists. But he would basically, he, he had a class in spiritual dynamics, which is a class that I was taking at the time. And he would challenge his students at the beginning of the semester to pray for no less than 50 people who were sick to be healed. And he never had a student come back who had done that, that did not see someone healed, made well, never. And so I wonder, you know, even as spirit-filled, charismatic, Pentecostal, wherever you put yourself, how many people have actually laid hands on, prayed for, or cast out sickness and tried it 50 times before they thought, I mean, you, 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 feeling, you feeling me? Before, before we punt and give up and say, well, I just can't do this. Poor Jesus didn't know we couldn't because he said these signs would follow those who believe. What, just humor me for just a second. What if there's a learning curve to spiritual things. What if, what if the problem's not God? What if the problem is I don't yet know how to fully release the power of God? I might not know what to say or what to do. And maybe I stopped trying after number four or number five. I mean, what other areas of life are mastered without practice? I mean, if we get serious about this, we'd be looking for people that coughed. <laughs> These signs shall accompany those who believe. They will drive out demons in the power of my name. They will speak in tongues. They will, supernat they will be supernaturally protected from snakes and from drinking anything poisonous. They will lay hands on the sick and heal them. I mean, it just depends on how Holy Ghost inside of you minded that you are as to whether you'll actually even practice that. 
if we weren't worried about how we would look if things did not work, how victorious would we be? How much would we reach out and do what Jesus has commanded? Paul said, 1 Corinthians 4.20, the kingdom of God is not in word but in power. So here are four incorrect beliefs. I'm not going to preach them. I'm just going to give them to you. These are four incorrect beliefs or assumptions. A lot of people, not you, of course, but the people who are watching probably. Just kidding. Number one, incorrect belief is that there's a God-ordained division between preachers and people. You know, the pastor of a church is just the senior elder of a church, which is another brother and sister in Christ who are holding a spot in the way that they're gifted is to work out in leadership. Deacons serve, elders lead, but we're still all believers. Incorrect belief number two, the church is called to operate primarily inside a building. That's not true. We are the church when we go out there. And that, that whole commission in Matthew Go into all the world and preach the gospel. A better way to have translated that would be as you go, preach the gospel. Well, how does that differ? Well, as you go to the grocery store, as needs present themselves, be open to the nudge of the Holy Spirit to pray, to cast out devils, to heal the sick as you go. Number three. Here's an incorrect belief, but this, this, is, this is prevalent, I think, especially in charismatic congregations, that Christians today are just a different quality of believer than those in, a, in 1906 during the Azusa Street Revival or the Welsh Revival or you name whatever revival, current or past. We're just, Christians are just a different breed of people. No, we're not. Same Holy Ghost that raised Jesus from the dead 2,000 years ago. Same Holy Ghost lives in you. Same Holy Ghost. We've got the same Bible. We've got the same Holy Ghost. We've got the same commission. Same power that raised Jesus from the dead. Number four, incorrect belief is just this. The primary role of Christians is just to make money and support the vision of those in the ministry. Every one of us are in the ministry. Every one of us has a ministry. That's just our life. And you know what it is? It's just the overflow. Your ministry, my ministry is just the overflow of the love that we've received from God. It's not judgment. It's not criticism. It's not telling people they're going to hell. That's not good news. Do you realize that, right? The gospel is not, hey, you're going to hell. The gospel is you don't have to go to hell. Jesus paid the price and he's not holding your sin against you. Come on over here. Let's party. Man, I preached a whole message one time on the prodigal son. The father said they were going to begin to, they're going to have a good time. He said, we're going to have a good time. And then they began to have a good time. That's like ellipses in there, but that's the whole story. There's a party going on. And it's our life. That should be our life filled with joy, filled with freedom. And as we go, where there's so much love spilling out from the inside of us, so much joy that it's infectious. And it's just like, you don't have to hunt people down to, to get delivered from demonic activity or from addiction. They're looking at you because it's like their mind is just melting because in the current situation or knowing what you're facing and yet there's joy. Okay, can I have time for one quick application? I'm not going to do two, not going to be three. How do I apply this? Okay, that's, remember I told you about four sessions ago, I like to do the, the what, so what, now what. Here's the now what. what do I, how do I apply this? Simply this, don't miss your moment. Don't miss your moment. What's your moment? The moment is somebody says, man, my back is killing me. That's a moment. You can demonstrate the power of God to heal right then. Uh, man, I don't know what I'm going to do about my grandkids. There's a moment. It's the opportunity. They've opened up a door for you to show what God can do. 
What if it doesn't work? What if it does work? Now, did I ever tell you guys about the story? I had chronic back pain. And at one particular time, I was eight months in pain. If I would sit down or stand up, it felt like what I thought it would feel like if somebody shoved an ice pick like into my, into my spine. That's how much pain I was in. And I prayed, I believe God never got any better. So I had a nudge to go uh, to visit a friend of mine that I used to minister with. His name was Billy Smith. He's in the presence of God right now. But he had a healing ministry. And it, I mean, wild stuff would happen in his ministry. He prayed for, he prayed for a lady. This was in Canada because she wanted to lose weight. He laid hands on her. He said, you could see her dress. She was wearing one of those big muumuu dresses. You know what I'm talking about? The big, you could see the dress like com- compressed against her. She had an instantaneous weight loss of about 40 or 50 pounds. I don't remember what exactly it was. That's a miracle. That's not a healing. That's a miracle. I'll tell you another miracle that happened in Billy's life. This happened in our youth ministry. There was a kid, just an average sized kid who said that he wanted to be, I don't know, he wanted to be 6'4 or something. So Billy's like, he's going to demonstrate the power of God. He lays hands on him, speaks to him, commands him to start to grow. You know what grew? His feet grew right there. He had on, he had Converse high tops on that he had to take off because they were too tight. And he walked out of there with the, with his feet hanging off the back of that shoe. You know, he had, he had to hang his foot off the back, hanging off the back of that shoe. I thought, God, you are so smart. You didn't grow him this way without growing the appropriate foundation this way. What was that? That was a miracle. So I thought, you know what? I've tried to stand on my own faith. Nothing's happened. I'm going to get agreement. So I went to Billy's house and we chit-chatted a while. I remember he was in his chair. I was in this chair and he, he must have sensed or the Lord told him or he just saw my face grimacing that he, uh, he, he's like, Mark, what's going on? Why, why are you here? And I'm like, Billy, it's my back. I've been believing God, yada, yada, yada. And so he just like, like he speaks to my back. Doesn't pray for it. He speaks to my back. Instantly, nothing happened. <laughs> See, we all like the suddenly, right? We all like that. I mean, that's, the, but I had made up my mind, no matter what happens, I believe you from the moment, whatever he does is done, that I've received my healing and I'm, 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 I'm that's it. That's just it. I'm drawing a line. Thank you. And you know what? Three days later, for the first time in eight months, I rolled out of bed and I was like halfway to the kitchen before I realized I was pain free. So I'm not responsible for results. I'm just responsible for not missing my moment and just flow and be easy to flow with what the Holy Spirit says to do. I'm almost there. This is, this is just me. I'm not saying you have to believe it. I'm not saying it's 100% right. But I think we ought to live like this anyway, even if it weren't true. And that's simply this. The greatest power is available at the initial prompting. We ought to at least act like that's true. Because you know what? Have you ever waited and it, then it, the opportunity just faded? You ever? Yeah, that's happened to you. It's happened to me. It's just like, but when that opportunity, if we would just go with the flow. How much glory could Jesus have if we were just bold? This, our former pastor, Dwayne Sheriff, said this, and I, it's, it's wisdom and it speaks a mouthful. He says, I will never let what I don't know keep me from having confidence in what I do know. That's so good. Now, let's just assume you got anything, honey? Okay, I'm, I'm going to ask you to close out in prayer. Today. I just feel like that's it, so I'll need to get a mic. But here's the, here's, here's the deal, and I'm closing with this, and then Sister Lisa's going to come, and she'll do whatever the Lord tells her to do. Jesus sent out 70 and told them, you know, heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils. And they come back rejoicing that the enemy, the, de- the demons were subject to them in Jesus' name. And he says, look, I saw Satan fall from heaven. That ain't no big deal. 
He said, rather than that, you rejoice that your names are written in the book. In other words, you rejoice that you're saved. So here's the, here's the balance point for this. Let's just say you start, man, you start moving mountains and dead people are rising, your shadow's healing people. We're not supposed to get focused on that. We're supposed to be focused on a relationship with God. And the big deal, the major testimony is if you've received Jesus, you're on your way to heaven. Come on up here, honey. Let's welcome, let's welcome Lisa. Wherever. It's a mute button. Try that. Good morning. You know, that message is really speaking to me. I'm, I'm so thankful for the infilling of the Holy Spirit. When I received the baptism of the, of the Holy Spirit, that's what changed my life. I mean, I had committed my life to Christ, and I knew I was saved, but I didn't have that power to walk in the presence of the Lord and in the power of the Holy Spirit, the confidence that comes with that. And I just want to encourage you, if you have not taken that step, that's a step we need to take today. And we're here to pray with you and for you. But the message today is speaking to me in a way to realize, you know, the greatest times of my life are those times that I live conscious of the presence of the Lord, listening, hearing his voice and obedient, obedient to his promptings. And, and it's convicting me today, realizing you know what? I'm probably not walking in that as full as I have at times in the past. Are there any of y'all that can relate to that? That hearing this message today makes me say, Jesus, I want to be more conscious of your presence and, and respond to your promptings. You know, I have some wonderful times in my life that I've heard the Holy Ghost and stepped out and obeyed and spoken those words and had the presence of God come on me and move through me in ways that are powerful and lives are changed. And it's so awesome. But then lately it seems like there have been distractions and busyness of life that, that keep you focused on those things. You know, that's a plan of the enemy, just busyness of life. So I want to pray with you today. I feel like the Holy Ghost is saying, how many of you would say, God, I want to be more conscious of your presence? What I wrote down today is God conscious, not me conscious. God conscious, not busyness conscious. You know, everything we do is ministry. Whatever you're doing, when we're conscious of the presence of God, we do it in his power, and he can use it in real estate, in home, as a mom, as, a, as an elder, as a, uh, um, you know, anything you're doing. The Holy Spirit wants to use you and prompt you and lead you and minister to you and through you in that. So I want to pray with you today and ask God to fill us with his Holy Spirit again afresh anew. Father, we pray today. We thank you. Thank you that we're your children. We thank you for the gift of salvation you've given us. And we thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit. Fill us anew today. Say, I want you to pray with me. Say, God, fill me today. Afresh, anew, fill me up to overflowing that I follow you that I hear your voice, that I speak forth everything you'd have me say, that I do everything that you'd have me do, that I'm sensitive to you today and every day. God, put people in my path that I can share your good news, that I can pray for, that I can speak your word to and bring life and good news to those around me. God, use me today and every day in Jesus' name.